It's the Wilk Report. I'm Michael Wilk. Coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. With me is Larry Bernard. We're following up on my review of Halloween 2018. Uh, We're going to do a little bit of interactive discussion, and then we're going to move to uh, some other topics. Halloween 2018, which turned into the uh, surprise... uh from, at least from a dollars earned versus dollars spent standpoint, uh, hit for this year. Yeah, because uh, Deadline Hollywood reports that uh, it has screened past two hundred million dollars, which I, I already uh, kind of mentioned that in my video earlier today. And it costs what, like two million to make, or something, or ten? Well, okay, or well the uh, the Hollywood Reporter says that. Uh, its total budget was about $15 million, uh, which makes sense because the, uh, yeah, I, I mean, mean the Jamie Lee budget Curtis. was $10 million, but the marketing budget was about $5 million. So, okay. uh, but as of today, uh, well, as of yesterday, actually, the domestic total was $150 million, and when you add up the, uh, Seventy nine point two million for, and it brings it to two hundred twenty nine point six million dollars, uh, give or take. So, uh, yeah, I mean, th- th- this is a movie that is really successful in terms of mm-hmm. box office gross. I mean, I, I mean, fifteen million dollars total budget and two hundred twenty nine million dollar box office gross. I mean, you, you subtract the fifteen million from that, we're, we're still talking a, a tidy little profit here. Yeah. That's massive return on investment. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's no way this doesn't get a sequel. So, uh, I, I had done my review of this, and, uh, yeah, because it also says that uh, it was the biggest horror movie opening with a female lead and biggest movie opening with a female lead over the age of 55 on a budget of $15 million. Uh, overseas, Halloween has a staggered rollout with the uh, credits return up. Laurie Strode striding into 23 markets in its first session before adding 39 markets last weekend, when it was also the number one movie internationally, dropping just 47% in a stronghold for a slasher pick. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, this movie is a smash hit. I mean, people really seem to like it. And, uh, I mean, so what were your thoughts? I assume you've actually seen it. Um, I was never into the original Halloween movie series yeah that uh i never was really super into horror movies but i mean it was good but yeah i, I had a couple it, big problems with it myself it doesn't really feel like it's part of a continuity of movies it's like hey we're getting the same actors together and doing something kind of sort of similar right well uh i assume you've seen the movie all right so uh i i mentioned in my review that the uh opening credits actually have two meanings that, and I, I think they're both applicable but you know one is kind of like hitting the rewind button back to the end of the first film and then also kind of like restoring something that it kind of like rotted and collapsed in on itself the franchise as a whole basically and you're kind of restoring it to you know being brand new for uh for the 21st century so it you know that that's a pretty bold statement that you're making right there in the opening credits yeah and, uh, but you know, this whole dynamic of kind of like turning the tables. Cause in the first film, Michael Myers is kind of like laying the trap for Laurie Strode. Cause he's been stalking her the entire day and like murdering people and, and using them as bait to lure her in. And in this movie it kind of flips that. So now she's the one who's laid the, ba- uh, laid the bait and set the trap. Yeah. I mean, it just doesn't really feel to me though. Like it's the same movie series the same characters right right i mean it's kind of like an alternate reality where it's like you yeah. pretend even the the first halloween 2 didn't happen i mean it's a sound movie you know good acting good direction good decisions but that that's like was always a little jarring thing in the back of my head yeah i didn't like what they did with the doctor character though i mean he, he was like turns out he was helping michael myers the whole time possibly helped him escape uh you know killed the the one sheriff in order to protect him and, you know, all, all to try and set up a, a meeting between him and Laurie Strode and trying to get him to speak. You know, I mean, I, I just, 
I didn't buy that. And, and I also didn't buy the contradiction where, you know, Danny McBride was quoted in an interview saying that Michael Myers wasn't going to be some supernatural immortal being. And yet, you know, again, as in the first film, he takes injuries that would drop a normal person. So I, I don't buy that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just... I mean, is, he's either a ghoul or he's just a freakishly strong dude. He's, he, he can't be both. Right, and and that really kind of ticks me off because it's like, eh, guys, you know, just stop. Pick one. Yeah. But, uh, all right, so moving on to Goblin Slayer, episode yeah. five. Uh, yeah. That, I, I've been pretty happy with the whole run of Goblin Slayer. Yeah, because uh, part three, we... we uh, yeah, episode three was kind of slow. Introduced the other members of the party: uh, uh, yeah, dwarf, four and elf, and a lizard man all walk into yep. a guild house, uh, which you know is kind of a joke. Yeah, three, three there, and four it, were basically a, a pair. You know, the first half of their first adventure is a team, and the second half. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and you know, really kind of shows what Goblin Slayer can do up against something other than trolls and goblins. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, episode five. He's uh, you know he actually barely features in this episode because he he's and you know spoiling warning for anyone who's watching this. Uh, yeah, he, he's kind of like almost a supporting character, and it kind of focuses on uh, you know the, the world. Yeah, it fleshes out the world some more. Yeah, because uh, there's a couple of uh, porcelain ranked adventurers, uh, one of whom lost his sword, and he's trying to get it back, and. Uh, you know, so it's kind of like the, we're in the middle of the series so far. It's like episode five out of like what twelve. So yeah, it's uh, it's getting interesting. Yeah, and I mean it. It's well paced. Um, I don't remember in the manga where it goes from year next. Um, I I read that a little bit ago, but I like the pacing. I like the development and expansion of the world. Yeah, and I'm, I'm I'm happy with it. Unlike another show I've been watching. Yeah, that uh, quiet you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we 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 finally get an episode of Doctor Who that's halfway decent, and it turns out the monster is a reject from Lilo and Stitch, which takes me out of it. I'm sorry, but this is the oh, monster yeah. wasn't so much my problem it was that okay we're both grown-ups and we, we can both accept that science fiction uses fancy monsters and weird science stuff to focus on you know social political cultural issue so you got a man flipping to having a baby you know you have the rich uh powerful successful person you know taking drugs having a uh so submissive male uh, consort, although they don't imply it's necessarily a consort that she's having sexual relations with. Right. Well, it, he's an android, basically. Right. But he's, he, he's right. He's basically there as her servant, uh, confidant, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's yeah. It, it, it's there, really there wasn't weird. really any adventure in an episode where they were basically dealing with a CGI monster because they get cutting off to all these little weird little side trips right and you know here we had like a, a a classic monster in the house story and the monster wasn't was the too focus cute. of the story right, right and also he was too cute right i mean too cute i mean for for one i mean for my part i i would have liked the episode a, a great deal if not for the cutesy monster because he's like i'm sorry this is like the doctor who version of a porg yeah and i mean like, you had the planet with all the wrecked ships and the mines. Well, what it would have made more sense for, well, obviously the mine is there to try to fight the alien monster. And then, you know, you then have that unveiled as they're getting healed on the spaceship and how this whole area, there's all these asteroids and things are all connected to these alien monsters. And then one gets on the ship and the doctor and her companions have to help everybody survive. And then it unfolds out to, oh, it was just hungry. And it wanted access to the power sources on these ships, and that's why they keep doing this. And then they use the bomb device, and it gets full. She shoots it out in space. 
Right. And it's like, and again, you know, I mean, the, the monster looks like some, like a Disney cartoon. So I, I can't get it. I mean, if they had made the monster look, look as dangerous as it actually is, you know, I, I could have forgiven a lot of what was in the episode, but you know, again, it seems like the, the villains and the monsters are almost afterthoughts in Dr. Who under Chip Knoll's run. And I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I like that they're focusing on character stories, but there's got to be a balance between character and plot, and the plots seem kind of like contrived, too easily resolved, and the villains are, are really more afterthoughts. They're not really present the way that they've been under Davies and even of, under Moffat, who, you know, as bad as he was running the show, he at least understood that you need a villain that is, you know, genuinely frightening, and the, I, I just am not... My, my problem is the I lack can't believe of, that they pose a serious threat. My problem is the lack of real story focus. They they seem to have an idea of what they want to do in the story, but they don't know how to focus it and make it effective. And I'm kind of tired of Jodie Whittaker doing a Matt Smith and Peter Capaldi mashed together impression. Right, or David Tennant thrown in for good measure. And yeah. it's just, yeah, I mean, and it seems like, and part of that is understandable, you know, because each actor to play the role has incorporated, uh, you know, favorite doctors from the past. Matt Smith channeled Colin Baker early on in terms of personality. Sylvester McCoy in terms of uh, manipulation. Uh, you know, so, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that but, no, really gets I'm incorporated seen, into each actor's. Yeah, but I'm not seeing enough of her take on the character. And that's probably something I would blame on the writing because I don't think the writing staff are really giving her the opportunity she needs to actually innovate with her character. No, they're not. And, and that's what really bothers me because, you know, we're halfway through series 11 now and it just seems like, uh, and Christmas it, it, has been canceled and we're going to get a year break. Uh, yeah. Well, from what I understand the, uh, the source for, the, the the Christmas cancellation rumor is uh, the Daily Mirror, which apparently, it, I mean, it's a tabloid uh, publication, so people are not really giving it a whole lot of credence. So we'll, I, I think we'll see what happens, you know, with the, 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 Christmas the biggest episode. the biggest uh, grain of salt they give that they say, well, they they canceled it because they didn't have any ideas. And like, I could come up with a half a dozen ideas for Christmas with these characters, right? And uh, you know, it's like. Yeah, well, like I said, considering it's a Daily Mirror, uh, which, you know, really lacks credibility, uh, I'm, I'm going to hold off on that. I don't think even Chip Noll is, is stupid enough to not have a Christmas episode, but uh, we'll see what happens. But as far, but uh, rumors have been confirmed that there is a delay uh, for filming, although how that's going to affect uh, the schedule the going into is, next year, it, it, it's, it hasn't been confirmed right. yet, but... If the worst case scenario plays out, though, that's really not good. And no, from what not. I've heard from other sources, I haven't actually seen their hard numbers, is that we're back into the run-of-the-mill average numbers for a Capaldi episode. That the, the novelty of the new Doctor has worn off. Right, and uh, it, it seems to me like a large part of this, and you know, like I said, I mean, I was willing to give the show a chance. Uh, you know, I, I like Whitaker's performance. You know, she's a capable actress, but Chibnall just doesn't seem to know how to give you know insert well written stakes into his uh, into his episodes, and, and that's what really bothers me because, like, you know, the the monsters are and the and the human villains are afterthoughts they're they're barely present and so the threat doesn't seem real i mean and and that's really the, the biggest problem <coughs> which you know because i i'm 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 not having any kind of problem with the character development i mean it, you know there's all these wonderful little moments that kind of like you know make the doctor and her companions and even some of the guest characters seem a lot more real. Whereas under Moffat, we've got the opposite extreme where he just like says, Oh, okay. A good example, a good man goes to war. He's got like these two, uh, 
gay Anglican married Marines who uh, <laughs> who, who say flat out uh, we're, we're the fat, thin, gay Anglican Marines. Why would we need names? Which is, you know, kind of emblematic of Moffat's run. It's like, you know, guest characters are, you know, they're not even worth getting names. So you really don't get that level of saying, okay, these are real people. We're, we're just... You know, they're, they're just concepts on a page that aren't really fleshed out. Well, Chibnall solved that problem, but you know, the other, you know, the the other side of the coin though is that the plot suffers. And to me, it's like I need both character and plot. You don't have to sacrifice one to have the other. And why can Doctor Who writers and showrunners not understand this? Uh yeah, and. Like, for this episode, you know, you had, I mean, the whole pregnancy and fatherhood thing, I'm not entirely sure why that was there as a plot beat in the plot. Yeah, that, yeah, I mean, well, he's a human-looking alien where the uh, the males give birth to boys, the females right, give but, birth to girls, and, but, you know, right, why would you have... The whole point of that there was for, um, what's his face, the young guy whose name is completely, I'm blanking on right now. It was for him to have like a little moment to help him get closure about his father who abandoned him. Right. So, I mean that that that's a good idea, but I don't understand why it was in this episode. Yeah, I don't understand it either. You know, except but, you, know, it, you know, except it, that it was the, this episode. Like they wanted to show the stakes, so like you know, it's not just everybody having fun and adventures. No, that things can sometimes go wrong but they didn't show any real teeth for the stakes. So it, get, it was just a real serious lack of focus. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, express.co.uk asked an interesting question. Uh, for spoilers, will Ryan's dad be a villain on the series? Why? Uh, that, that's kind of stupid. Yeah, because he's more like an absentee father, didn't even attend his own mother's funeral, so I'm not sure... You know why this is even being asked? I mean, there might be a redemption arc for his character at some point, but not not to think I've wasted time with this season. Right, right, uh, and I think a large part of this will be it, it has to do with we don't really have much of any kind of villain in, in series eleven that's even worth mentioning. I yeah. mean, Chris Noth. Uh, in last week's episode that was terrible right i mean right because i mean you know again a villain who's hey, barely present a... in the episode and then you're, you're trying to make him stand in as trump but then he's not trump and doesn't like trump you know but he's competing with trump to be you know the next the trump. giant so, asshole right right so and but you know he actually solves the the crisis for the doctor because the doctor is like Oh yeah, it's just a poor animal. It can't even breathe. It's dying, and Chris Noth puts a bullet in it. It's like, oh well, then it's a mercy killing because, you know, it's like I mean, he's the only he he's actually the, the only one who actually has a, a practical solution, which is okay. What you you want them to prolong their suffering by suffocating them or starving them? I mean, come on, he, he actually has a point, and I'm sorry, but that is, oh my god. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, it's like yeah, with, with the Express uh, article, uh, Arachnids in the UK. Uh, Ryan's dad sends him a letter where he invited Ryan to live with them as he was his proper family compared to Grace's husband Graham. Then in uh, this week's episode, he said he thought his father avoided him as he reminded him too much of his dead wife, Ryan's mother. And and so the article is saying like these multiple mentions of Ryan's dad are one of the few elements that have been mentioned in different episodes of Doctor Who. So, you know, I guess, and, you know, this goes to something that was also posted on Screen Rant where they're, uh, you know, they're making speculations uh, about the Doctor's past being rewritten based on, you know, what seemed to me like kind of throwaway flushing outlines that the Doctor is mentioning about her past. And it's like, no, uh, no, she's just doing what the, uh, all the incarnations of the Doctor have done during the, the since the series revival in 2005, which is, right. Which is right. Just kind of just either 
make shit were, up or just uh, talk about stuff like, uh, you know, stuff that you may not have heard before because they're trying to flush a, the doctor out. And they like, actually had uh, Colin Baker, I think, one time during his run said that the doctor had already had eight regenerations unless I'm lying. Right. I, I, I th- they, they even did that in Old Who, too. Right. So, you know, to me, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, and, I, and I think, you know, part of the, the reason for a lot of this speculation is because there, there doesn't seem to be anything to, to of any substance to speculate on. I mean, there's a timeless child uh, motif, but other than that, uh, it, there's really nothing. Except for cutesy monsters or, or sympathetic giant spiders or or uh, time-traveling racists who are, you know, are hardly there. Yeah, and also time-traveling racists for some reason. Right. Well, I, I think to the extent that he was trying to... It, it, he represents, you know, the, this relic of the past of white people trying to, you know, regain the, some of the, the power that they had... Yes, that's the, that's the meta. Of right. That's the meta, but I mean, like inside the universe itself, doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, it doesn't. So you know, I, I'm kind of, I mean, I want to give this show a chance. Like I said, the, the the characterizations are are brilliant, but you know, it's to the detriment of plot. And you know, again, this is a weakness that Chipnall has had, even in Broadchurch, where you know, I mean, the the whole point it's a character driven series, but. You know that that the plot really suffers because you're focusing almost, and I hesitate to say focusing too much on character, but when it gets to the point where the the actual story itself suffers, and you're wondering what the hell is driving the action because there doesn't seem to be anything any motivation for anyone to actually do anything. Yeah. And now we've got Disney cartoon monsters on Doctor Who. On the one episode in this series, it actually felt like an episode of Doctor Who, and they screwed up on the monster. It was a legitimate sci-fi episode, something we haven't really seen in Doctor Who in a serious long while. Right, and and, uh, next week we get uh, some insights into Yaz's character when they go to India circa 1947, but... Excuse me, I'm still not over my cold. But, uh, yeah, it's... Yeah, I don't know. I'll keep watching, but it, you know, like I said, I mean, how long Whitaker lasts in this role is going to depend largely on the writing. And so far, you know, the writing has really been mediocre. And uh, here, on, here's my question: Is if they do hold off a year before the next season, which I think would be atrocious, and if they do a course correction in the writing and the stories and in the production, I don't think that helps the show. If they no. do a wild course correction over a year. Right. And honestly, I, I don't like to put much stock in rumors, especially when they're coming from, you know, what's widely considered a tabloid source. But on the other hand, the BBC is known for doing stupid things with Doctor Who. Yeah, because they, they did actually refrain from broadcasting in 2016 because, uh, you know, their official line was they didn't want it to compete with the Olympics. Well, yeah, that's kind of BS. And then they're bouncing around the Saturday schedule and... And it's almost like they were kind of punishing the show for having Peter Capaldi on as a doctor. Yeah, and again, it wasn't really until the last two series that Capaldi... uh, uh, Until he really had his real footing as the doctor. Right, and then by that time he'd kind of been pushed out and uh, kind of pressured into quitting. You know, uh, you know, at least according to the rumor mill, uh, although yeah. there's been no official confirmation, but you know, it, it seems like you know, the, the the BBC is making all these mistakes and kind of taking the show for granted, and then they're kind of blaming it on all the wrong people while rewarding people like Moffat because uh, Moffat apparently is now working on destroying Dracula. Well, I mean, he does have you know his wife and his uh, mother, his mother in law. Yeah, nepotism at the BBC. Yeah. Yeah, nepotism everywhere, unfortunately, and and that's really what's what's killing a lot of these franchises cuz you know, and of course uh, oh, you know, this 
reminds me, I, I want to focus on uh, something that was posted on Midnight's Edge Facebook page. Because, the, I mean, this is hilarious. I mean, uh, apparently there is a Star Trek fan group that decided to ban uh, posts from Midnight's Edge in the group because, uh, according to them, uh, Midnight's Edge spreads a lot of falsehoods and it's like, and the sources that they're using uh, to back up that claim are themselves quite questionable. Yeah, and... Look, when you're playing insider baseball stuff with uh, sources, you get pieces of the information. Be it little bits and pieces of the information. And so you have to put them together and try to make a reasonable picture. Right. And, right. And, and you know, keep in mind, Midnight's Edge actually has a pretty good track record. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the reputation that they do for for getting a lot of stuff right and, and trying to avoid actually a lot of the uh the more rumor mongering because uh, we're class bullshitters and i mean they I, I won't say that they're necessarily a bad source you know but you know they, they do like to you know exaggerate and also kind of like focus on say star wars for example to the point where they, they talk about almost nothing else well look star wars got them a lot of clicks I'm, yeah. I'm just saying it, it was probably, you know, a reasonable course of action. You, you, you can't fault something uh, if you're chasing those clicks. Right. If it works. Right. But, uh, yeah, and yeah, and unfortunately my browser is being sluggish uh, as usual. It's not, it's not, because I'm, I'm doing my, my show on the laptop right now. My, uh, my desktop computer is set up, but unfortunately... I don't have any way to hook it up to the internet because I don't, you know, it's all hooked up uh, internet servers back at the last place I was in. So, yeah, this is all, uh, yeah, in, in fact, I'll, uh, you know, just to uh, explain my situation, my uh, one of my roommates, uh, the one who actually is on the lease, uh, turned out to be a complete psychopath. So I'm uh, staying with relatives right now until uh, until I get myself my situation uh, straightened out because it, it's uh yeah because the guy apparently has been stalking a friend of mine and uh, along with members of her family sending them death threats and going onto the property and damaging stuff and yeah you know i found out about it and then he found out that i knew about it and you know the, there then there's some other stuff that he's been pulling like pocketing the rent money and not paying it to the landlord and so when i and some of the other roommates decided okay we're just going to pay the uh-huh. landlord directly because that's what you know, he says we should be doing. So now he's, you know, pulling all these stunts to try and get us out of there and uh, take our stuff. And I'm like, because uh, because he's already uh, proven himself to be a liar and a thief. He's gone into my room and stolen stuff and uh, disappeared some other stuff that uh, like cooking instruments that I had downstairs. And yeah, so, uh, you know, so that's basically why uh, I'm right now in my relative's basement spare room with the uh heater just 10 feet away from me making all sorts of noise and internet connection that is maybe about maybe oh i don't know maybe about five bits per second basements are not good for uh internet connection no they're not and mine wasn't all that great when i was on the second floor uh with the higher data speed so yeah but, uh, all right, so let's just see if I can call up this thing from Midnight's Edge Facebook page. Because it's pretty hilarious because the, the, the reasoning that these guys on the, on the Star Trek group are using, really, it, it can be applied as easily to them as to Midnight's Edge. And like I said, Midnight's Edge really has not gotten a whole lot wrong. And even the stuff that uh, turned out not to be uh, according to what they predicted. Uh, I mean, they mentioned right off the bat, this is pure speculation and we don't know until we get some actual official yeah. confirmation. So, you know, don't, they're actually saying, you know, don't take this as gospel. We're, we don't really know. We're just speculating. And, you know, if it turns out, uh, you know, the official news confirms what we were speculating about, great. If not, then, you know, you were forewarned. 
So I don't see where they're being at all dishonest. Yeah. All right, and of course, browser is just not cooperating. All right, but uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I want to try and see if we can get Tom and Rob and uh, it, some point. Random to uh, try and discuss this because it, because it, even Doomcock has uh, now gotten in on it and kind of did his own video today uh, mentioning uh, th- this whole Facebook incident. Cause it's like when it, when it gets to a point that a, a, a fan group that has over a hundred thousand members is now banning a, a popular YouTube channel that happens to criticize STD because and they don't like any criticism of STD. Now, I do think some of the interesting things uh, were in that most recent uh, video, the one featuring um, how STD actually had lower ratings than Enterprise did when it was canceled. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, and, you know, people who, you know, try and say, oh, well, it's a streaming service and you can't apply the same standards. Well, but here's the thing, though. The show was created to really launch the streaming service and basically be the flagship show. And if it's not getting in the viewership, then you cannot call this a success. And if, and, and apparently people are butthurt over that. So, so uh, have you been uh, keeping up with the Diablo controversy that uh, hit BlizzCon? You know what? I have not. And so I, I'm Diablo... Not sure I, I'm not a, sure I feel safe discussing anything related to that because it's like, oh. Uh... Well, there, there, there's some basic points that are kind of, kind of, kind of simple enough to say. So, Diablo was a popular series of video games, technically still is. Um, yeah, and, I remember the cover artwork being uh, pretty badass. Yeah, and in 2012 was their last edition. There were some hiccups with it, but they eventually got it all sorted out. And people have really been asking for the last six years, like, hey, when are we going to get our next game? And Blizzard said, hey, we're going to have a huge Diablo-related announcement. And it was a mobile game. To which people said, um, uh, what? And, they said, and the, uh, the Activision Blizzard developer said, oh, what? You're saying you guys don't have phones? And it was a, it was a mobile only, and they didn't have a plan for releasing it to the PC or to one of the consoles. But it turns out, uh, a couple of days after the fir- of the brouhaha, they have a PC sequel to the series that's been in the pipeline that they were going to announce, but they felt that it was too far behind to announce it. So they decided to instead announce, hey, we're cloning a uh, Chinese game so that we can... Uh, use that Chinese game to uh, sell a, a mobile version of, of Diablo. And the fans are kind of angry about it. And so there's all sorts of defenses by the usual suspects on the internet. They're talking about how, oh, well, mobile gaming allows us to get more females into that. So obviously this is just sexist fans. And, you know, this is an entitled fan culture, you know, demanding that the game companies produce things that they want. Yes, how dare we want game companies or TV companies, comic book companies or movie companies to make something we want to see and experience to be entertained by? How dare us? Yeah, yeah, but you know, but here's the thing though. Where have I heard about someone ripping off another video game before? Oh yeah, could it be because STD ripped off someone's video game (laughs) and is now getting sued? And and, uh, oh, and then of course, even after the lawsuit, uh, CBS decided to force Star Trek Online to incorporate FTD and the Tardigrade and the Spore Drive into the game. That's kind of interesting, and I so I mean I mean that can't last very long either. All right, so uh, all right, so the uh, post in question, uh, I managed to call it up finally, but yeah, so uh, yeah, Travis Vincent Linton uh, in the Star Trek group. Mm-hmm. 
uh, on Facebook, uh, post it November 3rd announcement. Good evening, everyone. I hope everything's going well for your day so far. I'll try and keep this brief because it's a subject we don't need to delve too far into, but it regards sharing the content of a YouTube channel called Midnight's Edge. A lot of you are undoubtedly familiar with the channel, but for those of you who aren't, they're a channel that discusses pop culture, particularly science fiction, and they love to talk about franchises like Star Trek, mainly post-Enterprise, Star Wars, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, particularly if there's controversy tied to the subject matter. However, a lot of these videos tend to do nothing but stir the shit pot. Uh, the admins and myself have made a decision to bar the videos from entering the group from this channel. Our main reasoning on this is that this channel tends to lean towards spreading inaccurate news and theories with little to no evidence. They made several bold claims that have not held a lot of water for years now and have spread stories and theories when there's plenty of uh, blah, 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 when we're not citing any evidence to show that we're that these guys actually are giving inaccurate information or spreading anything that's unfounded. So, yeah, it's just, in fact, actually, uh, the, the, one, uh, the, the one thing that they did post in defense of what was to a video that's uh, gotten more dislikes than likes because the guy rambled on for almost an hour without himself citing any actual evidence of... And it's also almost a year old. Yeah. And th so, this is a thing that I don't understand. People who are doing the work of multi-billion dollar companies for free. Yeah, I mean, it's like, if I'm going to shill for something, I expect to get a paycheck. All right? That's right. So, CBS, if you're listening, if you want us to do an 180 degree turn on uh, the Star Trek program's we will, but we do want a paycheck for that. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I want a thousand also, dollars Luke, for also every Lucas word. Film, also, <laughs> Lucasfilm, we're willing to sell out our integrity on that. Yeah, uh, well, th th this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, but you know, kind of half-joking. Uh, we'll take the pay. We won't necessarily guarantee that we'll give you glowing reviews. Uh, we'll give it an, uh, an honest evaluation and an honest chance, yeah, no, but no, I mean, we, we, do we, we wouldn't a sell out for that, but it, it would be nice to get, you know, an official response, uh, funding for this or even, you know, some comp tickets, but, but no, but yeah, because, these people who are defending them aren't even getting that. Yeah, they're, they're not. So it's like that they're, they're basically just, you know, lemmings who don't even question what they're being told, you know, and the, you know, that kind of goes to my, uh, dislike for uh religion and and tribal politics because you know there's no there, there's no room for any criticism or questioning of any kind you just gobble up whatever the side you like or suck up to tells you and you don't think about it and then when someone comes along and actually gives you a reason and a, a nuanced and uh you know supported argument you know, in, in in defending the, his or her criticism of, of the thing that you like, you know, then you know instead of even responding with a reasoned argument of your own, you just flip out and, and do stuff like this. It's like, and a lot of the comments in the thread that was linked to kind of say, you know, you know, guys, you know, I took a look at it and you know I'm not really seeing it, and you know, it just kind of shows your character that you're banning this because you know. It, it seems like you're kind of censoring people that, just because you don't like their opinions. You know, so you're basically doing, you know, Midnight's Edge some, uh, you know, some unintended PR. Yeah. So, have you been keeping up with what happened with uh, Sony and the new censorship rules on game content? Oh, God, you know what? I, I have not, but you know what? Let, uh, let's go back to the Diablo thing, because I'm calling this up on GameSpot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, we will talk about the Sony thing, but I, I wanted to uh, kind of get back to this Diablo, because you, know, you went into this whole exposition, and then I took us right back to the midnight session because the page finally loaded so yeah but so now the uh but yeah uh blizzcon this weekend blizzard announced uh 
a brand new Diablo game, but it wasn't exactly what fans were expecting or hoping for. <laughs> Diablo Immortal is a new Diablo game for mobile devices that Blizzard is developing alongside partner NetEase. NetEase. That, that sounds more like, re, like texties or retard speak. You know, no offense to people who are mentally retarded, you know, but, you know, so, some of these nicknames that people give something to try and sound clever or, or corporate speak, it, it's dumb. But, uh, all right, so even though Blizzard told fans weeks ahead of BlizzCon that they shouldn't expect an announcement of the next mainline Diablo game at the show or a reveal of a new mobile game wasn't the kind of surprise someone were hoping for, the next big Diablo game, potentially Diablo 4, is likely in the works, but Blizzard said nothing about it at BlizzCon. And like you said, apparently they ripped off a Chinese game. Well, they they paid for that. Yeah, I mean, basically paid it, and it's like, okay, so you're just so wait, they, so they didn't even rip it off. They they actually bought it and slapped the Diablo. That that sounds a lot like what they did with. Um, they paid the Chinese firm. Yeah, that sounds. You know, they paid. The- it sounds more like the, you know taking a generic property and slapping a label on it and expecting people to to accept that it's what you're selling it as it's kind of like what they're doing with uh let's see std star wars a whole bunch of other stuff uh yeah you know i, I can sense harvey cthulhu uh, and doomcock getting worked up about this <laughs> cuz this is this is hilarious i mean uh, it, it seems like the, these suits over at uh, major companies are, are just really, really clueless here. Yeah. Now, on, <coughs> on the related video game note, you have Sony that has moved all of their PlayStation-related executives to San Francisco. And now all the decisions for how games are made are made out of San Francisco, so Japanese games are starting to get American-styled censorship of sexual content. And it's become popular in the Japanese market, but the PlayStation's also been declining overall in the Japanese market. Yeah, and, uh, you know, which is surprising, because I, I, uh, and, and, you know, just kind of a a full disclosure, I... When, when I was a kid, I, I started off with Atari, then I moved to Nintendo NES, and then Super NES, and then after that, moved to PlayStation and PlayStation 2. I, I was never able to get the PlayStation 3 or 4 platforms. But, uh, you know, this is... I mean, that was just my preferred uh, platform after Nintendo was uh, Sony PlayStation. So, uh, you know, it's kind of disappointing that Sony really doesn't seem to know what the hell they want to do anymore with their most popular gaming platform. And now, yeah. and now they're moving for like censorship. And of course my browser wants to freeze up on me again and not respond. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, a popular bulletin board service has decided to, uh, purge all support of Donald Trump from its, uh, bulletin board. Well, to be fair, not a whole lot of people want to have talk of him right now. He's yeah, but no, no, talking about is... shooting unarmed people at the border who are, you know, just if basically saying if they throw rocks, we'll treat that as an act of war and shoot them. Yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, you say stuff like that, and then you know this is coming on uh, on he... the heels of uh, se- uh, several mass shootings that have taken place over the last week or two. But but here here's more why I was bringing that point up is that. The administrator said, well, we're not going to use this to purge people, and we're not going to use this to, we're not going to allow witch hunts, but we both have experience with internet bulletin board. What almost always happens in these kind of scenarios when there's a large blanket ban like this, people start getting pushed out, people start getting tricked into saying something, and witch hunts inevitably happen. Yeah, and you know, I've, I, I've been on the receiving end of... Uh, because yeah, I, 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 back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, I used to post quite frequently on uh, internet forums, and you know my opinions were not always welcome. But you know, just because I expected people to have standards and abide by them consistently, and they didn't like that I pointed out hypocrisy. 
and people in turn on the board started asking questions and the moderators saying, yes, but because of this section of the rule, this section of the rule, and this section of the rule, mods could start going through people's Facebook posts and said, look, you know, we're, we're telling you you're not, you need to be content with that. Yeah, and, and you know, it's like, because I, I have a bad enough time with uh, the idea that uh, employers can go through your social media and, and based on seeing things they don't like, you know, fire you for that. And it, cause I, well, first of all, it's not your business what people post on their social media accounts. It's like, as long as they show up on time, do the jobs that they're being paid to do and, you know, don't, uh, act like assholes, then, you know, who cares what they post on their social media feed? I, it, I mean, unless they're actually representing the company when they're doing it, who cares? Yeah. So, uh, th- this is, uh, while, while this is all good content, uh, I was tossing that out there to see if your browser had gotten caught up yet. So has it? Uh, yeah, I'm looking, I'm trying to look up news here. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Sony placed in. Okay. All right. Uh, here's something from October 15th from kitguru.net. Sony posts job listings in preparation for next generation PlayStation. Uh, while there are hopes that the next generation of consoles could arrive as early as next year, it's worth remembering that Sony has only just made its tentatively titled PlayStation 5 official. In fact, the company is still getting the ball rolling, actively recruiting for a senior product manager and senior software engineer for its proprietary network. First spotted on Reset Era forums, both job listings went live on October 14th, looking for San Francisco-based workers to help pave the way for Sony's next-generation console. And while neither the PlayStation 5 nor its more common acronym PS5 are mentioned throughout the post, both roles are expected to pave the way for a next-generation PlayStation experience. So let's see. uh, Alright, so let's... Type in censorship in San Francisco. I actually that does. tossed you something uh, for a link. All right, yeah. On that. Of course, these censorship rules, uh, they're, they're not censoring violence. Oh, yeah, because, uh, yeah, you, you've, yeah, you've got no problem with showing people getting their heads blown off or anything, but, you know, show one pubic hair and it's like people want to go ape shit. That kind of ticks me off. So, all right. So, all right. Not seeing it, and of course, Skype now doesn't room. want to cooperate with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, anybody who's listening to this, please donate to the Patreon so Michael can get back into a stable situation where he can actually have a dedicated broadcast space. Yes, please do because, uh, yeah, the sooner I get my own place, the the better. Because, yeah, the Wi-Fi here is a, a, abysmal. But, uh, yeah, and, and no, I've got no problem uh, playing the violin, um, you know, and when I need to. But uh, well, well, yeah, all right. So I'll... let me let me uh, re- read uh, the article here for a second. Do. Yeah, better to do that. Yeah, I'll just have you read from it because my browser's not cooperating. This is from uh, GameRevolution.com. Recently, Sony instituted a new policy that began uh, restricting the amount of risky content that developers can have in their games. This change came as a shock to the many studios as PlayStation systems, primarily the handheld, have long been console platform of choice for gamers that leaned into a erotic territory without becoming a full-blown adult-only title. Uh, revolving around sex, but now that has changed, it will be, show how willing Sony is to bend to societal pressures around sex and not violence. And they're showing a picture here of in uh, the Sony girl version in of bikinis. Yeah, I, I I think I found it. Yeah, it's just where getting it. The yeah. new Sony version of it, it has exposed sunlight covering all of her not naughty parts because the bikini isn't exposed, and if you look at it even the nintendo version is now showing more version the the two nintendo in the pc version than sony wow i mean mean, this is i mean 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I thought that the whole reason we had like the, the game maturity ratings was so that people could make an informed decision and say, okay, well, we'll have these games for adults and then we'll have these games for kids. And, you know, but why can we not trust adults to police themselves and, and be aware of stuff like this? Why, why do we have to, you know, impose censorship just because, because we have to might... think of the children. Yeah, but you're exposing them to wanton violence. Well, yeah, but that's okay because we say so. <laughs> right, and and I'm actually one of those people who who does not really buy into this whole thing that uh, you know watching something or like say I I, I remember uh, when Ted Bundy, uh, you know, watching old archive footage of his last interview when he was kind of like. Uh, trying to blame violent pornography for driving him to, or, or contributing to him being a serial killer. It's like, no, 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 no. Cause you made the decision to murder people because you're a psychopath and you have no empathy and you know, you, you, you always had a choice though, but you, you could have said, no, I'm not going to kill anyone, but no, you chose to kill people and not, and not because you're about that, to be uh... executed. You're trying to blame porn. Who was that serial killer who killed all those nurses in Chicago back in the seventies? Name is completely escaping me right now. I don't. Was know that Speck? Was possibly, or no, not Son of Sam, was it? No. Um, no. All right, all right. So yeah, all right. Finally loaded. Yeah, I've got a little picture of uh, girls in bikinis and uh, one pieces. Yeah. So the reason I mentioned Richard Speck. My dad actually ran the jail in Peoria County, Illinois at the time when he was sent there for sentencing and for trial because uh, they couldn't have a fair trial for him in Chicago. He used to deliver mail and food to Richard Speck, and when he was in the j jail, Speck said, yeah, I just felt like killing him. So whenever you hear stories about these people saying, oh, no, it was violent pornography that turned me into the killer, or it was drugs, or it was this or that, a lot of those guys just say that because they want to be manipulative. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. if, if you recall, uh, Charles Manson was always making up stories uh, and uh, acting crazier than he probably was just because he was an asshole and wanted to uh, get people to sympathize with him. Of course, being a complete psychopath, uh, he never really came across as sympathetic. So, You know, carving a swastika into your forehead, that kind of... That kind of makes that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, wow. L lots of head banging on my desk kind of stuff here. Mostly because of the poor wannabe on Doctor Who. Uh, e oh, my e God. I, I still can't believe they decided this was a good idea because it, it just ruined what for me would have been a, a, a actually a good episode this season out of so far a very mediocre one i mean hell the the third episode rosa actually didn't fe feature rosa parks all that much no it didn't which was kind of weird what well, what was the whole point of doing that if you weren't actually going to feature the character in an interesting way Right. So, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much a longer take on, uh, not only Halloween, but a whole bunch of other stuff. So, uh, all right. So, uh, it's getting late and, uh, my relatives are due back soon. So this is Michael Wilk and Larry Bernard for the Wilk Report saying, if you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, feel free to hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon to receive notifications whenever we upload new content. And for the love of God, please <laughs> get over to our Patreon page and uh, help me get back on my feet here so I can uh, 